Hello and welcome everyone uh, and thank you for uh, joining us today. This is uh, obviously Happy New Year for uh, everybody and uh, this is our first uh, session of the year for the uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Training Program. Just a few housekeeping items here before we get started. Um, first of all, chat is enabled. Uh, your mics are disabled. Uh, or Yeah, your mics are disabled, video is disabled, but you can use chat. So if you have questions as we go on uh, throughout the presentation here, feel free to use the chat session uh, and we will try to keep an eye on that uh, and answer the questions as we go. There will be a Q&A at the end as well too, but uh, uh, we'll try to answer them on the fly here. So again, welcome and uh, let's go ahead and get started here because we got a lot to talk about. So my name is Brian. I'm the Chief Technology Officer here at PCA Technology Group. I'm also a certified ethical hacker, and really all that means is all the stuff that I'm pretty much talking about, the bad guys can do, I know how to do as well. Um, and it's just one of those things where in order for, to protect and talk intelligently about it, you obviously have to know how to do this too. So um, that's that's just the gist of it. So why are we worried about cybersecurity? Um, these stats are going to be updated here very shortly because we have the stats coming from uh, last year now, uh, but these are from still 2021. Um, but uh, you can see that, uh, you know, cyber cyber crime and cybersecurity is, is not going to go away. Um, and anybody that has uh, any type of cyber insurance, um, if, if you had it previously, you'll realize when it comes time to renew that, that your insurance rates are going to go through the roof. Um, because uh, it, it's it's not getting any better out there. So um, if you haven't, if you don't have cyber insurance and you try to acquire that, you're going to see how expensive it actually is. But uh, <clears throat> a lot of a lot of a lot of folks out there, you know, are getting getting uh, hacked here um, in the Western New York area. You know, there was the one at the top there, uh, Arubis. Unfortunately, uh, they they were breached. Uh, was publicly disclosed that they were breached, um, and uh, that is a local company here. And then some of the other big bigger companies. Uh, you know, Microsoft uh, LastPass has been hit numerous times. Um, we'll talk more about that. Um, my suggestion, if you're a LastPass uh, user, and again, we'll talk about this later on more, but I would I would look at using a different provider or solution at this point. Um, they're just they've just been targeted time after time after time again, and it's it just seems like they can't uh, can't secure the the network, and it's where you store your passwords. So. Um, take that with a grain of salt. Uber was also hit. Uh, some some of their customer data was leaked as well. Uh, if you were part of that breach, you would have been notified by them already. Uh, and then a big one that happened fairly recently back in December was Rackspace. Uh, they got hit very hard um, and, uh, you know, they're still trying to recover from that. Uh, so it, it's not going away. And if big companies like this can't keep bad guys out, you know, small, medium sized businesses, uh, don't have a chance either. So the idea is, is that uh, we're going to try to show you some of the tactics that the bad guys use, and hopefully you can avoid some of the pitfalls that uh, allow them to breach your systems. The other thing to keep in mind is that if a bad guy does happen to get into your system, um, it's not like they're throwing off, uh, you know, alarm bells or alerting you to the situation. Uh, they're in, they could be in your system for up to seven months before they make themselves known. Um, so just just be aware that uh, that that does occur. It's not like you'll you'll know about it right away. Um, and that usually 60 percent of the businesses that suffer some type of uh, significant attack end up going out of business uh, within six months. It's it's very devastating, uh, not only from just the technology side, but from, uh, you know, reputation and things like that. So. So who's responsible for this? Well, a lot of people think that, oh, well, you know, I, it's not my company. I'm just an employee or I'm not an owner or, you know what, my IT's got me covered. Um, no, it's it's not just their their issue. It's it's everybody that's listening to this right, uh, presentation right now, this webinar. Um, everybody's responsible. Um, the bad guys target the end users. And I'm assuming if you're watching this, you're an end user or a computer user. Um, and that's who they go after um, because it doesn't matter how good your security system is. If I can trick you or manipulate you into letting me in, uh, I don't even need to worry about the, the security systems because you opened the door for me. So that's that's the idea behind this. We like to call it the human firewall. Um, and it's 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 got to be well known to everybody that that you are a piece of this puzzle. 
Um, so again, if something looks suspicious or something seems odd, bring it up to somebody's attention. We'll talk more about that as we go on to the presentation here. So how's all this done? It's done through something called social engineering. Um, and it, it's kind of a glorified electronic version of a con man. Um, and it's just done via, you know, electronic means instead of trying to convince somebody to buy a magic elixir that's going to keep them young or, uh, you know, snake oil or whatever it was back in the days um, when they tried to do it door to door. Uh, it's just basically manipulating uh, the human tendency of trust or their behaviors. Um, and it's extremely, extremely, extremely easy to do. Um, and it can be done without you even realizing it. So it's, it's one of those things where you you really have to be hyper aware of, of situations that you're putting yourself in um, you, that you may inadvertently not even realize what you're doing. But we're going to try to try to give you some examples of that so you are aware of what they are uh, coming up here. Most common attacks are uh, email. Uh, 90 90 percent over 90 percent of the Social engineering attacks are done via email. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about email, um, and that could be done with with phishing, spear phishing, um, or or email compromises for from businesses. Um, they like to get into systems uh, for businesses. That's what BEC stands for, and uh, and and try to basically compromise their entire email system and then go after people that you've communicated with or use old conversations and things like that. Uh, to try to manipulate others um, into into falling for some of their tactics. So um, social media is also used heavily. Uh, that's used for mostly reconnaissance. Um, you know, social media is is a big thing in a lot of people's lives. Um, and I will just we we don't talk a lot about that, but what I will tell you is be very, very careful what you post on on social media because, regardless what your settings are and i'm not just talking about your facebook's or your twitter's or your instagram's uh your linkedin's are the same thing regardless what you think your your privacy settings are there's ways to bypass a lot of that stuff and get a lot of that information without even being followers and stuff of you um so and a lot of that information is useful i could figure out uh you know there's a whole bunch of stuff we can figure out um you know you can a lot of times you'll you'll see these posts coming from people randomly that oh yeah you know out of out of these four colors which is your favorite color or if if you had to go back in time what was your first car or what was your uh what was your you know what high school did you graduate and stuff like that what you may not realize is you're answering those thinking it's it's just fun and games you're actually answering password reset uh questions because a lot of those are password reset questions um, so if, if, if it's set up by a bad uh, actor, you're answering some of your password reset things that they may be looking for and you're answering them inadvertently. So uh, just just be aware of that kind of thing. Um, some of the trends that are out there, are ransomware, obviously ransomware, if you're not familiar with what that is, a uh, bad guy gets in your system um, and they decide to lock your data. They basically in encrypt your data and uh, hold you hostage and basically say, well, you know what, uh, you're going to pay me X amount of money or you're not getting your data back. Uh, you, you know, you're not getting access to your data. So that that's ransomware. Extortion is sometimes they will actually offload your data. So they'll actually send your data to another location where they will try to sell it potentially on the dark web um, and they will extort you saying, hey, if you don't pay me X amount of money, I'm going to uh, release this data and sell it on the dark web. Sometimes they do both. Sometimes they, they lock your data and try to sell the data and they get you on both sides. So just something to be aware of that that's uh, a few things that happen. Uh, who's behind it? Uh, rarely is it malicious insiders, but you always have to be aware that there is potential for that. Um, most of the time, it's it's third world countries uh, or governments that aren't allies with with U.S. Um, that uh, they found that this is a very profitable business model, believe it or not. Um, and uh, the thing is, is that uh, they, they make a lot of money off of it. So um, they decided that the governments are going to sponsor hackers to try to break into, you know, uh, non-allied uh country companies and uh, just try to make a field day out of it. So that's what they end up doing. 
some of the vectors are done with cloud. Uh, it's, sometimes it could be mobile. And as I mentioned, with, when it comes to malicious insiders, uh, it could be a physical on-site attack as well, too, if it would happen to be uh, a malicious insider. So. so when it comes to web surfing, one thing you got to keep in mind is if you keep your web surfing, I'm talking about at work, obviously, if you keep that limited to business use, um, you will limit your uh, attack risks uh, and exposure. They tend to, if you're going to sites that you shouldn't be going to and things like that, or questionable sites that aren't work related, sometimes those sites are targeted or riddled with with uh, malicious intent and you could easily fall into a pitfall that way. If you keep it to, to business use only, it, it does limit that exposure risk. Um, and it's one of those things where you can really take it from a huge, huge attack uh, exposure down to a very small attack exposure. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when it comes to, to email as well, too. As I mentioned, social media, unless you're using it for business purposes, I would highly recommend staying away from that. I realize companies do use that uh, sometimes for marketing, depending on what kind of company you are. Sometimes it's uh, business to business or or, or business to, to customers as well, uh, B2C. Um, I understand that that does, does, is used. Uh, just, just be very, very careful how you use that if, if that is the case for you. Otherwise, you really shouldn't be on social media uh, if you don't utilize it for business purposes because then again, it, it lowers that attack uh, vector that could, could occur with that. The other thing too is make sure that you're keeping your browsers up to date. Um, that's your web web browsers, whether it's Chrome, Firefox, Edge, uh, Safari, w whatever the flavor that you happen to use, depending on your computer. Um, make sure that those are kept up to date. Uh, you know, the browsers uh, will alert you usually when there's updates. If you see that come up, highly, highly recommend that you uh, you you take advantage of that quickly. Uh, because the bad guys could leverage that that non updated browser to get into your system if, if you don't do so. The other thing too is is again it goes to the the malicious website thing. Um, if you keep your your business your surfing to business use, um, suspicious pop ups and download links um, are are also kept at bay too. So I know a lot of the browsers nowadays do have built in pop up blockers, but the bad guys like to uh, send pop ups up and and hope that you react to them. And it's as easy as if I have a malicious site set up and I want you to click on something, I'll start firing. Uh, 30, 40, 50 pop-ups with adult content in them, and you're going to be freaking out because you're, you don't want anybody to see what's going on, and these things are just popping up as fast as you're closing them down. You're going to click on something that I want you to click on because I'm putting you in a panic state. Um, so it, it's literally that easy. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where uh, if you, again, keep your surfing limited to business use, you will avoid a lot of those suspicious pop-ups or, or, or potential download links. Um, if you do find yourself in a situation where you got a pop-up on your screen, sometimes it might be like like one of the, the local news uh, channels here, or actually it's it's the paper, the Buffalo News. Sometimes if, if you go to that site and you start reading an article, you might get halfway down through the article and a pop-up will come up and say, hey, in order to continue reading this, you gotta you got to subscribe or whatever, and there's no way to read the article after that. Um, that's, that's not what I'm talking about, but that's an example of, okay, it's making you interact with that pop-up. Um, so in a malicious site, it could be the same thing that they might pop something up where you're unable to, to do anything unless you interact with that pop-up. If, if you're not really sure of the site and you're, you're not real sure whether the, the pop-up is legitimate or not, instead of clicking on, you know, either there's usually a close button at the bottom or there's a, a close X at the top right hand corner usually um, it, instead of clicking on one of those two areas you could potentially hit control W on your keyboard um, and that works on Macs Linux or or Microsoft um, and that will close down the window with focus most times it will be that pop-up window uh, if that doesn't work you can also hit alt F4 and that will close your entire browser down so you won't have to click on any of those two areas um, the reason why that's important is because what the bad guys do is they also put what's called a pop under on underneath that window. So when you're clicking on one of those two areas that they know you're going to click on, 
you're also clicking on a download link behind that window. So it'll close the window down, but it's also downloading something in the background because you inadvertently clicked on a download link behind that window that you didn't even realize was there. So they're they're hiding that behind that pop up window. So just be aware that that is a tactic. And again, if you keep your website uh, surfing limited to business use, you will, can avoid a lot of those potential pitfalls. Something else the bad guys have decided or realized that is a, is a good way to do it is uh, something that's called uh, browser and the browser attack. And it, it kind of goes on the pretense that they realized uh, users hate remembering passwords uh, and hate realize, remembering, you know, multiple logins for different sites that they gave to. So they've opted to use SSO, which is single sign on. Um, and what that is, is that allows you to potentially use one of your existing logins when it could be Microsoft, it could be Facebook, Apple, Google, Discord, Steam, things like that, where you use an existing login that you already have for a site that you're trying to access or sign up for. So um, you can see in this example, this is uh, showing an example of Canva. Uh, so you're going to, to the Canva site and says, hey, do you want to log in or sign up? So instead of you know continuing with email where you would put your email address in there, create a new password uh, and possibly a username, in this case, you're 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 using either Apple, Google, which is what is this the example showing here, or Facebook. So obviously Google was there, and then what would happen is you would put your Google uh, login in there, and it'll ask you for your password, uh, and then this site Canva would actually use your Google credentials to log in with that from from there on forward. Now normally that's a good thing, but I will show you why it's a bad thing because the bad guys have started manipulating people knowing that uh, they're using this more heavily. So in this case here, this is an example of uh, a malicious version of, of one of these. So if you go to a site uh, and this is a malicious version, um, that pop-up will come up saying, hey, you know, here's here, I want to use my Facebook login. So what's gonna happen is you can see on the, on the left side here, this is the phishing version of that. Um, and if you look down through here and compare that to on the right, which is actually the real version of that, this looks exactly like the real version. In fact, it even has the padlock there, so you can't look at that um, because even if you do click on that, it's going to match exactly what's over here. Uh, if you're real tech savvy, you're going to look at the, the URL that it actually goes to. And if you look at that, that's great. Uh, guess what? That matches over here, too. So visually, these things are identical. Um, this is extremely hard to detect. Um, so if you find yourself on a site that you're not 100% sure it's a legitimate site or it's a new site that you're not familiar with, I would caution using any type of single sign-on uh, because this tactic is extremely, extremely difficult to detect visually. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show you how to detect it, but it's it, visually, it's very, very difficult. So the next example here is this is the exact same thing. This is just Google. Um, so again, this is where you're trying to sign in with the site with Google. Again, the phishing one and the real one. If you look at this, the only visual difference is the create account one here, but that really wouldn't um, you know, raise any questionable things. And here you can see the difference because it just doesn't happen to be on this one. Um, but that is really visually the only difference. Again, if you click that lock, it's going to show the exact same info as this. Um, if you look at the URL, it's the exact same thing as this over here too. And if you put your information in here on this phishing site, it's going to log you into the site, but it's also going to send your whatever credentials you're using to the bad guys. Um, so that's what this is designed to do is to capture your credentials and send it to the bad guys. So whether it's Google, Facebook, whatever, if it's a malicious site, that's that's what it's doing. So it, it and I'll, I'll explain what's what's happening here. So what they're doing is is they're again much like the pop up on top and the pop under this is actually using a different different method but it's kind of the same thing so when you're typing in your your username and password on top here uh this is created using using some browser tricks um and it will actually pass the credentials to the correct one but it will also send it to the bad guy so the one way, again, visually, you can't tell the difference here, but the one way you can tell whether if you find yourself in a situation where you're going to use your single sign-on, where it's asking for that, that account information, what you can do is in this case here, if you, if you uh, left-click on the top of this browser bar here, 
on this window that pops up and you try to drag that outside of your browser window. If this screen does not leave the browser and pop up on its own, it's a fake site. Um, it's the easiest way to tell. This is this this window is malicious. If it does not allow you to drag that outside of the the, win, the browser window that you're in, if it does not leave this this border, then uh, it is not going. If it doesn't leave the border, it will. It, it's a malicious site. The real one will let you do that. So if you try to drag it outside the border, it will actually let you drag it outside the border, and it'll pop up on its own on the on outside of this initial screen in your browser here. So that's that's one way to tell the difference. And the reason why that works is because again, they're using some browser uh, technology here that does not allow this to escape the existing browser window because of how they're displaying this, where the real one is not using that and it will let you escape that. So if you ever find yourself in a situation, that's one easy way, not visually, but you can at least uh, you know, uh, physically try to drag that outside there. And if it does, then you're then you should be OK to, to use that. Me personally, I don't like use a lot of single sign on stuff. I usually create users with my email address and a separate user account and a separate email password. That way I don't have to worry about this kind of stuff anyways, but I'm pretty hypersensitive about this. I know a lot of times people don't want to remember all those logins. So but just just passing it on that that's that is something that they're doing. So that leads us into email. As I mentioned, email is a big uh, a big thing when it comes to social engineering. So this is this is really big. Um, don't utilize your work email for personal usage. Uh, it, it's just like the browsing thing, but this is even more important. The reason why is because some of the tactics that the bad guys use are very easily detected if you follow this simple rule. What I mean by this is don't use your work email for your shopping habits. Don't use your work email for your gym memberships, your book clubs, your coupons, your your personal mailing lists or whatever it is, your book of the month clubs, whatever it is. Do not use your work email for that. Use your personal email for that because you're not going to get fake shipping notices. You're not going to get fake purchases. You're not going to get fake whatever uh, account uh, charges and things like that. Um, because if you do, they're easily recognized. If you're not doing your, your Christmas shopping using your work email uh, or your Amazon shopping or whatever it is, if you're not doing that type of thing on your work email, the minute you get an email claiming to be from Amazon and it's actually malicious trying to get you to open up an invoice, you, you don't even have to open it. You see it and say, like, wait, I don't do anything like this. Why am I getting this? Delete. You don't even have to work, worry about it. That's the easiest way to avoid a lot of these pitfalls. Um, is is to follow that simple suggestion that that will probably cut down 75% of your risk out of that 90 right there if you just follow that rule. Now, if you do use Amazon and things like that um, for for business, just be careful and and be aware of what you're ordering, what you're not ordering, and things like that. Uh, but that that literally will cut your risk uh, by 75% at least. On the flip side, don't access your personal email while you're connected to the work or from your work PC. If you do that, again, you're kind of doing the same thing as if you were sharing your email because you're opening that up on work resources. So if there is something malicious, it's already in the network, much like it would be if you are actually using your work email. So if you need to check your personal email, do it while uh, off your phone on its data plan or something of that nature. Don't use work resources. Anybody that's using uh, Microsoft Outlook, uh, I also recommend, highly recommend you disable the reading pane, and that is this little window over here. Uh, in this case, uh, you can see that uh, what the reason why this is a, an issue is because uh, when a message comes in at the top here, and you can see it's highlighted gray, uh, it will actually show the contents of that message automatically, so it's opening that message without you physically having to open it. That's a problem because we want you to interact with your email messages, not some automatic technology, because if there happens to be something malicious in there and it got past your technologies, this is opening that without you even doing anything. Um, so just be aware of that, that in order, you know, you want you want this to go away. So how do you do that? If you go up there to the highlighted view tab uh, and then scroll over to where it says reading pane, if you hit that drop down arrow next at the end of the, the pane there, um, it should show right bottom and I think it's off. 
if you select off, what will happen is this this window that is showing the contents right now will go away and you will have to physically double click on those emails to open them, which is exactly what you want to do. You want to be the one interacting with your emails, not some automatic program that's going to open it every time a message hits your ma mailbox. So this is an example of a phishing email. Uh, again, what is a phishing email? It's basically an email that looks like it's coming from uh, some trusted entity that uh, you you either are familiar with or whatever utilize. Could be Apple, it could be, in this case, it's Microsoft, but it's it's trying to entice you to do something. So this this looks like it's coming from Microsoft, but it isn't. Um, it's, it's designed to look this way uh, because, again, it's trying to trick you. So what are they trying to do here? Well, they're saying your password is expired. So what's the first thing you're going to do? Oh, my gosh, my password is expired. Well, I can't lose my email. If I got to click on one of these two links. Well, they got you. That's exactly what they want you to do right out of the gate. They want to want to put you in a fight or flight mode with with your with your uh, your your thinking. Um, and a lot of times people don't think rationally when they're in that in that uh, type of situation. Um, so they're just going to magically just think, OK, well, I'm just going to click the change password here, either this section or even I can click this down here to do that. Rule number one, if you ever get one of these emails out of the blue. Follow this advice, this will cut down at least an additional 10 percent out of that 90 percent. So now you're down to 5 percent of potential risk if you follow not only the the first one, but also this one. This never click links in emails ever ever unless it's something you just generated never follow any links in emails ever if you follow that you will keep yourself out of trouble heavily um and i'll explain what i mean by by unless it's something you just generated so what happens here again this is a fake email looking like it's coming from microsoft what will happen you click on one either one of these two areas it doesn't really matter it's going to send you to a site that looks like Microsoft, and it's going to ask you for your login and your password. And much like the browser trick that they did before with the single sign-on, it's the same concept. That page is set up to harvest login information. And what's going to happen is they're going to take your username, because you're going to put it in there, and you're going to put your password in there, and it's going to send that to the bad guys. Um, now, if that page is set up by uh, a smart hacker, what they'll do is you'll get an error message the first time and then you'll think, oh, well, and then you'll see the page refresh itself and you're going to put it in the second time and it's going to work and you're not going to think anything of it. Bad hackers will just keep refreshing the page and it will keep erroring out, erroring out, erroring out, erroring out. And you, you kind of don't really know what's going on. Um, but uh, so what what's happening is, is the smart hacker, what they'll do is the, the first page is a fake page. And then they they take that information and whatever you put in there, it gets sent to them. The second time around, they refresh the page, but they refresh it to the right Microsoft site. That's why it works the second time. Um, and you don't realize that they actually change change pages on you because you just weren't you weren't keeping an eye on things. And that's that's kind of how they trick you. So you think you either fat fingered your password or something the first time you really don't even realize you gave your your information away. Um, so how do you avoid that? Never, ever, ever click on any links in emails that it's not something you just generated. So how do you avoid that? OK, you get one of these emails. It looks like it's coming from Microsoft Outlook. What do I want you to do? I want you to. OK. Oh, wow. I guess my password is expiring. OK, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go down here. I'm going to open up a brand new browser. In this case, it's Edge. I'm going to open up that and I'm going to go to Microsoft site myself by typing it in there. And then I'm going to log into that page because I know I got to the right Microsoft site. And I know it's the real site because I typed it. Um, you're not following blindly following some links here that that could look like it's going to the right site that it probably isn't. So that's the easiest way to avoid these pitfalls. Easiest way. Again, this is just another example. This just just happens to be one that looks like it's coming from a financial institution. It says, OK, hey, I want you to uh, look at uh, uh, a deposit or an actually in this no it's a, a yeah a withdrawal from $135 from a foreign bank uh, again they want you to click on this link that's what they're enticing you to do so in this case again never follow links that are buried into emails if you're a trusted bank customer or M&T or whatever key bank citizens bank whatever your local bank is you get one of these messages if it's not something that you just generated 
what I want you to do again, go down, open up a browser, type it in yourself, but go into whatever the bank name is, log in there because you know you got to the right site. It's not a fake site that this could be redirecting you to. It will stop almost the rest of the remaining risk that you have by doing that. So now your, your 90, 95% risk went down to the remaining 5%, and we'll talk about what that is later. Here's a little more, here's a little different technique. So this is called spear phishing. So it, it's still using email, but this one is targeting internal uh, entities, usually pretending to be an employee. And this happens a lot. Um, this is usually targeted towards payroll or HR, and it's basically someone pretending to be an employee um, and asking them to change their direct deposit information. You need to have policies and procedures in place that you do not blindly follow any type of financial request via email um, only. You need to either follow up personally with that person or get that person in the same room with you, verifying that it, this is actually the person that is making this request. Um, because again, it's one of the situations, this is someone pretending to be an internal employee. They're sending you direct deposit information for a uh, bank account that is basically set up with a stolen identity. And the minute you send that person's payroll thinking it's legitimate to that account, that account is cleared out and closed. And by the time you realize what happened, you are the company and the, and the employee is out the payroll because they never made that request. And you have to uh, come back and pay that person because you inadvertently didn't follow procedures. Uh, ultimately, the company is responsible for that money. And more likely than not, it's gone with the wind. Um, at that point. So if you ever get one of these type of requests, you need to make sure that you are verifying it's actually the entity in person at a known phone number, not one that's transmitted via email um, or face to face in writing. That's that's the easiest way to avoid these type of things. The next one is whaling. That's going after the big fish um, or pretending to be the big fish. In this case, obviously sea level folks. Um, whether it's CTO or CFO, CEO, CTOs, things of that nature, um, they, they try to utilize the authority fear uh, to, to get people to, to entice them to do things. So in this case here, it's one of these where it's, it's someone to pretending to be uh, the CFO and emailing. I'm assuming this is somebody that either works in in the financial department or or somewhere along the line saying hey you know i'm out of the office i'm busy i need you to process me a wire transfer today let me know when you can do this and i'll give you the details again any type of financial transactions never blindly follow via email another common tactic is hey go buy me some gift cards or hey go buy me whatever um because i i'm going to give them out to clients or something never ever ever do those type of requests financially via email you need if if you're sean and you get this email you need to one go go over to roger's office and and check and see if he's actually there first of all that's that's the easiest way to do it second of all if he's not in the office and he is out of the office then you need to call him at a known cell phone number uh or a known contact number that you know for a fact is his and that wasn't transmitted within this email um that way you know you're really getting roger um again you know, I've had a few people that uh, have asked questions and, and when we get to this section, well, I can't I can't go against my my C level person when they're asking me to do something. Um, I can tell you this, uh, any CEO or CFO that gives you pushback for trying to make sure that you're keeping the company's best interest by just asking them, you know, hey, I got this email. Is this valid? They're 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 not good for the company, in my opinion, um, because, you know, you're looking out for the best interest of the company and they have to realize that you're doing that. And there's nothing wrong with you questioning, hey, is this valid? Because this is a tactic that is used heavily uh, and a lot of people have fallen for this. So it's definitely something that you shouldn't be afraid to ask uh, if, if you get uh, and verify what the person that's claiming to be. So how can we stop some of this stuff? Well, there's there's an easy way to do it. Um, at least it won't stop it, but it'll at least give you an idea that there might be something amok uh, when it comes to this. How, how does that happen? So we, we enact what's called an outside or an external banner. So what happens is, is any email that's coming in from outside of your organization would have 
this external banner that's saying, hey, this email is outside of your organization. Don't click on links, open attachments unless you recognize the sender and know that know the, this content is safe. So why is this important? Well, for two reasons. Let me go back here. So in this case where you have a person pretending to be uh, an internal employee, obviously a, a keen eye would, would see that maybe the email address is off. But if, if you're looking at this on a mobile phone, you may not see that. You'll just see the name and say, oh, yeah, well, OK, I'm going to change this person's direct deposit. Well, if you have that external banner on, this email would have that. And you should be questioning why someone that is an internal employee would have that banner on it, because if it was really an internal employee coming through internal email systems, it would not have that banner. So it's a very quick visual way to determine, wait a minute, this is saying it's an employee, but it's coming from the outside. That's a big red flag. And you should be questioning anything that this either has attached or anything like that. Uh, same thing when it comes to this. This is a person uh, in this case, Rogers pretending to, you know, uh, reaching out to Sean, uh, someone pretending to be Roger. If it has that external banner on it, it's not coming from an internal resource uh, because it would not have that banner if it is. And what's important about this is it, you can also recognize this in, in cell phones, too, because uh, I know cell phones are real hard sometimes to tell. Now, there is a way to make this one step further. Um, and a lot of clients don't do this, uh, but you can also tag, uh, add an additional thing onto the subject line that when it comes from external, it'll actually put external and then the subject line. So it'll it'll prepend that or append that to the, the subject line and, and you can actually physically see it in the subject that it says external. Uh, so again, on a cell phone, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it does kind of convolute things and, and make the subject line a little longer. But it, again, it's a visual way of telling whether this is really coming from inside or outside. This is something that on almost all email systems is included. It's just a configuration change that you just add it. Um, if you're an M365 customer, it's, it's simply turning it on. There's no cost to it, um, but it definitely adds a lot of protection and gives you uh, a quick visual way of telling that email is coming from the outside. And if it's somebody that's claiming to be inside, you should have a huge red flag when you see that. So bad guys realize that uh, people are getting smarter and they're not clicking on some of the stuff that they used to click on. So they've taken their game up a few notches. And what they're doing now is they're doing something called consent phishing. So what that is, is uh, you may get, uh, you may be asked to, to give permission so they pop up this little application here and it's asking for permissions. Um, and if you're not careful and you just blindly follow this and hit accept without questioning it, what's gonna happen is you're giving them full blown access to your contacts, uh, your data, uh, your mail, your calendars, your one books, your files. They have access to everything. You basically gave them access to everything. And oh, by the way, they don't need your password either because you allowed them to bypass that. And if you're using multi-factor, you've allowed them to bypass that too. And if you're not sure what that is, we'll talk about it. So if you ever get one of these uh, windows pop up, please make sure that uh, if you're a client of ours, call. Uh, we'll quickly log in and take a look at this uh, and, and see if it's valid or not. Um, but, uh, you know, the there is valid reasons for this sometimes with integrations. Um, that it may ask for that. Sometimes CRM packages and things like that might do that. But again, if you're one of our clients, just please call our service desk. We'll be happy to quickly remote in and take a look at this for you and just give you some advice on it. But don't blindly click click accept. In your case, I would I would hit cancel in almost all cases. But uh, in, in the situation, again, where you're not sure and you're a client of ours, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to happy to talk to you about it. So the other thing, too, now with uh, uh, everybody looking at at trying to do touchless things. Um, QR codes are a big problem too now. Um, so what is a QR code? It's this little bar thing here um, that many of you may have seen. Um, and it, just just to give you an idea of how easy it is to to get people to to scan these things blindly. Anybody that watched the Super Bowl last year might might realize that during during one of the commercials there was a screen that just had one of these little codes bouncing around on the screen. Uh, it was just the code, no no anything. It was like a, a, an old game of Pong for those of us that are old enough to remember that. And this little code was just bouncing back and forth on the screen. They had 2 million people scan that code. 
That's how many people they had scanned that code. Nobody knew what it was. And, and luckily, it was just advertising in this case. But it just goes to show you how many people will just blindly follow these codes, not even knowing where it went. Um, so it was it was marvelous marketing genius. It was absolutely and it was a perfect example of social engineering and how easy it is to get people to just do something with <laughs> didn't even ask them. I mean, there was nothing there, a black screen and this code just bouncing around on the screen and people took out their cell phones and scanned it. Two million people. It's crazy. It's just absolutely crazy. Um, it was harmless, luckily, but in, in the case, it just goes to show you how easy it is to manipulate. You can you can use these to send people to all kinds of sites, and it's as easy as walking into a restaurant because a lot of restaurants have gone to uh, touchless menus and dropping uh, a malicious one of these on on a table. You realize how long it would take for the restaurant to even realize there's a malicious version of this on because people will scan it thinking it's a menu. And yeah, maybe I can send you to a menu, but it might have something malicious on the back end that's going to install on your cell phone or something. Um, so you've got to be very, very careful with just blindly following these codes. I'm not saying you can't use them, but in restaurants, you know, what I would recommend doing is if you walk into a restaurant um, and they do have this, make sure you ask your your server, uh, you know, hey, is, is this for you? Because again, you know, it's very easy to just walk into a restaurant and drop a malicious version of this on the table without anybody even realizing it if, if they're not using touchless menus. So um, and if you get one of these in emails like this email come in here saying, hey, you got a voicemail scan this again, would highly recommend not doing that um, because you really can't tell where that that is taking you even after you scan it until you get there uh, because the URLs are shortened and everything. And it's just it, it's it's a nightmare to try to figure out. So. Be very, very careful scanning those codes. So that goes into USB and mobile devices. Um, never insert a USB key, uh, like the little flash drives, into a machine if you don't know where uh, it came from. Uh, if you find one laying on the ground, please don't put that in your machine. Um, give it to somebody that, uh, uh, like if you're a client of ours, give it, give it to either us when we're on site or give it to a contact person where they can give it to us and we can make sure that there's nothing malicious on that and then we will return it back um, and uh, make sure that it's clean. If you do happen to use these to transfer files back and forth, make sure that you're doing virus scans on both sides. Uh, while, you know, if you're a client of ours, we do do monitor and, and control a lot of your AV settings uh, on your workstations, your work workstations. We do not do that on your home workstations. Um, so just in case something happens to hitchhike its way back and forth between your house and, and work, uh, you may need to make sure that you're doing virus scans on those. Um, Everybody uses a smartphone nowadays almost uh, and realize that they're pretty much battery hogs. Um, what you don't want to do is most of the charging cables are USB devices. Um, what you don't want to do is plug that into your desktop or laptop to charge your phone. I want you to use your wall brick uh, because what happens is, is which, while it will charge if you plug it into your laptop or desktop, what you may not realize is it also turns it into a USB device. Um, so if there happens to be something malicious on your phone that's waiting to get plugged into a computer network, um, you could inadvertently uh, infect your, your network or it could go the other way around too. It could infect your phone too. So uh, use your wall brick uh, that plugs into the electrical outlet. That way you don't have to worry about that whole thing from happening. Um, you also want to be very, very careful of public charging stations while you're out and about. So a lot of hotels, uh, some shopping malls, airports have these a lot that, oh, well, you know, my battery's dying. I want to get a quick charge out of it. Again, um, you know, I'm not saying all of these public charging stations are malicious, but there are malicious ones that are set up intentionally in public areas. And what is called is called juice jacking. And what it is, it will charge your phone. But like I said, it also activates the USB uh, uh, flash drive on that phone, where now if it's a malicious a charging station it's stealing data off your phone while it's charging so it's taking all your contacts all your email messages all your data your phones your your text messages your your photos everything it's it's pulling all that down while you're charging your phone and you don't even realize it so again uh use your wall brick uh most most uh planes you know with the smaller the smaller wall jacks uh, allow them in your carry-ons and things um, so uh, utilize those, then you avoid a lot of those pitfalls. So passwords, you know, obviously passwords is a big thing. We kind of touched upon it. Um, so our recommendation is 
to use complex, secure, and unique passwords. So what does that mean? It means that all the passwords that you use should be unique across every site you use them at. So it's got to be a different password for every login. We recommend 10 characters at minimum. And with those 10 characters, uh, there has to be at least one special character, like a ampersand, a pound sign, dollar sign, something of those natures, uh, at least one uppercase letter, and also at least one number. Um, so everybody on this presentation right now is probably saying, yeah, right, now I know why everyone uses single sign-on because there's no way I'm going to remember uh, umpteen passwords for every site that I go to and, and things like that. Well, there's a couple of tricks to help you with that, that problem. Um, so you can do that. So there's online managers. Uh, online managers are password managers that that will automatically populate those passwords when you get to certain sites. They will store your passwords. So when you get to those sites, it'll ask you, uh, do, you know, or it will just automatically fill the password in. So you are not physically remembering them. Um, I personally don't use them. Um, and one of them is LastPass, and we talked about that in the beginning of the presentation. There's about four or five big ones out there. Uh, the bad guys realize that everyone's password is stored in those, those areas. So they're huge, huge targets. And out of the four or five, three of them have been breached multiple times. Um, and LastPass has now been breached. I think this is the third or fourth time now that they've been breached. Um, so... Uh, I, I'm at the point where I don't, I'm not confident in any of those, which is why I keep them in a different manner. Uh, I store my passwords in a, on a secure USB key, which I keep on my person. Uh, it's encrypted. So basically I have to remember one password to unlock that USB key. So if I drop that, lose that, or someone steals it from me, I'm not worried about someone ever figuring out that password because that password is a 24 character password. Uh, and they're never going to break into it. Uh, they will all be long gone before that that time happens. Now, I do have paper copies of those two in case I do ever lose that because I don't know everything that's in there. Um, but in the event that um, my my key would somehow get compromised, I, I would have no problem at this point in time showing you every single password that I have in that password list because I am not recording the entire password. So I'm doing a couple different things. Um, I'm, I'm not only encrypting the, 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 the storage device that it's on, but I'm also not recording the password in its entirety. So how am I doing that? You can do it a couple different ways. Uh, known missing characters. So basically I'm only recording a certain number of characters on that password list that I have, um, whether it's a, a text file, a spreadsheet, whatever. Uh, let's say I'm using 10 digit password. I'm only recording seven digits out of that 10 digit password. I know where the missing characters are. It could be at the beginning. It could be at the end. It could be a combination of both. I know what those missing characters are, uh, but I'm not putting them on the spreadsheet. So when I go to enter my passwords in, I know I have to add them. And if anyone came across that list, they would never know that because they're going to take what's written down on the list. They're not going to know there's anything missing. Um, so they're going to try the first one. It doesn't work. They're going to try the second one. It doesn't work. They're going to try the third one. It doesn't work. They're going to be like, well, this is an old list. It doesn't work. I'm not worried about it anymore um, and move on. Um, so the other technique that you can do is adding extra characters. Now, with this one, you've got to be a little more careful when you add characters. And that, that's it. Again, we'll use the 10, 10 digit password thing. In this case, let's say I'm putting 13 characters down on my sheet. So I'm adding three extra characters on what is my real password. With this, you have to make sure you're randomizing those extra characters. You can't add the same characters, the exact same characters on every password because there's software out there that uh, I can run your password list through that would recognize the pattern and tell me that, that those are added characters, and then I would guess your real password. So what I mean by that is, you know, maybe your first password is is added with, uh, a, in this case, you can see an, an uppercase A and a B and a, and a T at the end or a Z and a T at the end. So the real password is this password in between here. And the second one might be, you're, you're changing up what the what the padded characters are. That's what you need to do in that case. Um, so a lot of people don't use that method because the missing characters are easier. Uh, it doesn't matter what the, what the characters are, it's just as long as they're not the same, they're not valid anyways, you're peeling them off. So 
Um, or you can use a combination. You can get real trick and use a combination of both added and missing characters. Again, only you know what they are. Only you know the pattern. So if anyone comes across that list, they would never have an idea what it is. So it's an easy way of recording passwords physically, where but you're not recording the true password in its entirety. So again, it's just uh, one way to, to follow that rule. Here's why we recommend 10 characters. So it used to be last year, uh, at the beginning of the year, it used to be seven, um, and then we upped it to, to nine midway through the year, and now we're at 10. Uh, by midway this year, we're probably going to be up to 11 or 12, I'll be honest. And the reason why is because the hardware speeds uh, that are used to potentially brute force passwords, and brute forcing is basically guessing every possible combination of these passwords uh, and how fast it can take. So you can see in a seven-digit password, if you're using numbers, uppercase, lowercase letters, and symbols, it's going to take me 31 seconds to guess every possible combination of a seven-digit password. I can guess that in under a minute. Every possible combination of a seven-digit password in under a minute. That is incredibly fast. Um, look at nine. You know, nine, we, we, used, we used to recommend nine. And that that will take me two days to get through every possible combination with the existing hardware that's out there. Um, and then at 10, it's going to take about uh, five months. And the idea is, is that if you're changing your password every three months, oops, sorry about that, every three months, then you uh, will be a, a moving target. So the bad guys, if it takes five months to guess and you're changing your password every three months, by the time they guess your password, it's been changed usually. And now there's always a chance that the way this works, it's all randomized. Uh, so they could get your password right out of the gate, the first shot, but to get through every possible combination, that's how long it physically takes at this point in time. And like I said, it's going to change because the hardware keeps getting better and better and better, and it really relies on the hardware speed uh, to brute force these things. So that's why we recommend the combinations that we recommend at this point in time. We mentioned a little bit about multi-factor. What is it? It's a combination of something you know and something you have. So something you know is your username and login. So what happens is you log into a site and it's going to ask you for your username and password. And if you have multi-factor enabled, what it'll do, it will ask you for a secondary thing after you put your username and password in there. It can do it one of two ways. The first way is it might ask you for an application, uh, a six-digit code that you have on your phone that is generated every minute. And uh, you, you put that code in and then it will let you into the site. Now, this will stop 90 percent of the hacker attempts. Um, and uh, the reason why it's only 90 percent is because if you go back to the slide before, you can see a six digit number instantly. I can guess instantly. Um, and that's usually what the codes are, are six digits. However, I have to be almost sitting next to you and know that you're waiting for that code for me to go through and start that process. So while it is possible if I'm sitting next to you, uh, I could get in even if you have multi-factor, it does make it more difficult if you do. The other method that they use is something called push too. So what it does is it will actually push a notice to your phone uh, and say, hey, is this you logging in? Yes or no? And you click that and then it will let you in as well. So that's another method that they could do outside of the application. But the problem with that is what the bad guys like to do is if they know you're using push, they use a technique called MFA fatigue. And what that is, is this isn't a case where your username and your password have already been compromised and they are trying to bypass your your MFA. So this will only work if your password has already been compromised. Um, so the case is, is what will happen is they will send a bazillion push requests to your phone uh, simultaneously. You'll get all these pop-ups. Hey, is this you? Hey, hey, is this you? 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 And finally, you just say, oh my God, make it stop, please. And you hit approve, you let them in. That's the idea behind it. They, 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 they're they, trying to get you to hit that approve button. If you start getting that kind of thing on your phone, instead of hitting approve, what I want you to do is change your password for whatever account it is, because your password has been compromised at that point. Um, never hit approve if you start getting those things. Um, because you're, you're basically just going to let them in. So that's that's uh, the one technique that the, the bad guys are using uh, if they realize you're on push. So some cybersecurity reminders, obviously, don't click, click links within emails. Uh, you know, that's the hugest and biggest thing. Always verify the person is who they claim to be. 
Uh, if they're asking you to do anything financially via email, uh, use strong passwords and MFA. Make sure you're storing your passwords securely. In the event that an employee does leave, make sure you're disabling those accounts because uh, a lot of times those accounts end up being utilized down the road and they're forgotten about uh, in breaches. Um, and make sure your data is, is regularly backed up. In the event you do find yourself in a ransomware situation, um, a lot of times your backups are your only saving grace. Um, in many cases, without paying the ransom, depending on your backup solution. Um, so make sure that those uh, those backups are are not only happening regularly, but also confirmed that they're happening regularly and offsite. So. So hopefully this gives you a little bit more uh, info on how to avoid and stop hackers. Um, at least uh, my biggest advice, again, is if it looks questionable, ask somebody. Never, never be afraid to question anything. In fact, I would question everything that looks out of norm um, because it's very hard to trick people and manipulate people that you're not directly interacting with. And what I mean by that, if you see a suspicious email and you're not sure, you know what, poke your head around the corner to your coworker next door. And, hey, can you just quickly take a look at this, please, and go from there? Uh, because I really think that, that I'm not interacting with that person. It's much harder to dupe uh, somebody that you're not interacting with than it is with someone you're you're communicating with via email. So just, just be aware of that. Um, so uh, some of the next steps, everybody that is attending this will get a certificate of completion. Uh, we do these on a monthly basis. The, the content, some of it does stay the same, but some of it changes too because the tactics and techniques are, are definitely changed. Um, the other thing too is that you can listen to more specific uh, security focused podcast, uh, especially on social media. I also talk about uh, public wireless and things like that. These are quick audio versions uh, that you can check out on our YouTube channel. Um, they're about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, I think the longest one might be 20 minutes. It's an audio thing, not only for work purposes, but for personal use. Um, I would obviously recommend checking those, those podcasts out. A lot of good data there and information uh, and tactics uh, that are used by the bad guys out and about in public, too. So uh, you can check out any of our current and upcoming events at our events page. And if uh, you are interested in figuring out, uh, you know, hey, am I secure? Or do I have a lot of things? Uh, you can claim a, a free assessment there uh, by sending an email to uh, info at PCATG.com. So uh, I thank you for your time. Uh, let me see here. Uh, if you're not able to use a wall brick, it is helpful to click no when the prompt asks you if you want your computer to connect to accessory. Uh, sometimes, yes, that, that will work when it comes. There's also cables that will stop data, too. Um, so that is a good question. Um, but some of those cables that actually are supposed to stop them actually are malicious as well, too. So you got to be careful of the source of where you're buying those from. Um, basically, what it does, it, it's a charge only cable. Um, Instead, so it, it will only send the electrical signals across the cable. It won't send the data side of it, um, but make sure you're getting it from a reputable thing. But yes, there is a way to do it on the computer as well. Um, the problem is, is when it comes to the public charging stations, a lot of times uh, your phones may not ask you uh, for that, and it, it just enables it on the back end. So depending on the phone, some manufacturers will let you do that, some won't. On the computer, yes, I agree. That is a good question. So. Um, that's the only question I actually see in chat here. So yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. There that was a great question. I don't see any other questions in there. Um, so I will give you back uh, two minutes of your day. I thank you for joining us. If you do have any questions following this, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to, uh, to answer those for you. And thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.